Um, all right, so uh, just introduce this talk is going to be about creating rich web stories um, with uh, the paragraphs module and um, a system called Island Dora. We're going into more about both of those. And we're going to be using um, a site we developed recently for the Baseball Hall of Fame in the US um, as an example of this approach. Uh, to introduce ourselves, um, I'm Alex Bridge, I'm a senior web developer here at Coda, and, um, and this is, <laughs> this is uh, my co-presenter Tassos, who's uh, another developer of Tassos, and between us we've been working on Drupal since the 4.7 to 5 days. Um, so, yeah, a quick overview of the talk. Um, first of all, we'll just introduce the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame project to give a big, bit of context. Then we'll be talking about um, dams, um, Island Dora dams, and how that relates to Drupal. Um, be talk then uh, I'll hand over to Tassos, and he'll take you through the Rich Web Stories approach that we used for uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame. And lastly, there'll be a bit of time for some discussion. Uh, so the Baseball Hall of Fame, um, it's based in Cooperstown in New York State and it's the um, central point for the study and history of baseball in the US and it's kind of a place of pilgrimage for people who are big baseball fans. Cooperstown doesn't have a huge amount else going in there. It's got a couple of other museums that I think have uh, sprung up in the light of the fact that there's already one museum there. But in terms of a settlement, it's not that large. It's mainly just a place with a few attractions in it. Um, the web traffic for the site last month, um, this was their peak traffic month because it's the month where they announced their new inaugurations for the Baseball Hall of Fame. You can see they had about 765,000 page views, about 305,000 sessions, and about a quarter of a million active users. So. Um, in terms of the development we, uh, we did for them, uh, they had an existing site in Drupal 6 with a very high number of content types, and we managed to rationalize that down to nine of them. Um, this was kept down by the approach that we'll be outlining, and that approach is also why you'll see we have a fairly large number of template files. Um, okay, so the aim of our project was yeah. to bring their archive online, really present it to the general public, um, and help create connections that bring that data to life, drive user engagement with the Baseball Hall of Fame, and that's really had two main aims. The first one was, you know, just actually getting that content out there, really um, helping show what it is that they do, but the ultimate aim for that then being to drive people to actually go and visit the Baseball Hall itself, their previous website wasn't really serving them very well in terms of um, you know, showing what they had to offer. It was very dull, it was very dry, and hopefully we managed to create something that was a bit more engaging than that. So on to the topic of dams. Um, what is a dams? It's a, a digital asset management system. Um, digital assets mean um, lots of different things to different people, and digital asset management systems likewise mean lots of different things to different people, but essentially it's a system that you would look, use for long-term storage of your digital assets, so that might be images, videos, documents, that kind of thing, and basically any asset that you might have that's been digitized, and also managing metadata that's associated with those assets. The Baseball Hall of Fame had an enormous archive, have an enormous archive, and they haven't really got that stored in a central system at the moment. They've got lots of different um, types of <coughs> systems storing lots of different pieces <coughs> of data. And they really wanted to be able to pull all that together and also be able to pull it onto their front end website. Um, so, good question. C couldn't you just build a dams in Drupal? I mean, the kind of content that we're talking about, metadata, um, digital files, that kind of thing, all that kind of stuff is perfect for a CMS as well. But, you know, for certain use cases that's true. For use cases where, you know, you have an image library, it's maybe, you maybe got a couple of hundred, maybe even a few thousand images, that's fine. But for someone like the Baseball Hall of Fame or other large libraries, archives, museums, who have potentially millions of objects in their collection, 
that starts to become a bit more unsustainable. And it's important to understand that digital assets aren't the same thing as web content. Um, you might well want to expose a lot of your digital assets onto the web, but managing the two things is quite separate and the kind of data that you're capturing for the two things is quite a separate thing. Um, and there's some very domain-specific domain knowledge and requirements that are captured in DAM systems that you'd have to build in from scratch to a CMS if you were trying to build it from the ground up in Drupal. It's much better to maybe look at a system that allows you to um, leverage all that functionality without having to worry about whether you've captured everything. Um, oh, sorry, just to go back. Um, so, in archival terms, <coughs> the lifespan of a website is tiny. I mean, if, if we think about websites that we've developed or that we've redeveloped for other people, typically, you know, they have a lifespan sometimes of as little as a year, sometimes five or six years before they're really due for a refresh. In, in terms of things like um, libraries, museums, for storing their digital assets, that's an absolutely trivial amount of time. They want to be looking at really long-term storage, long-term data capture, so that they can revisit that data in, say, 30 years time and it's still there in the format that they want, in the format that they're expecting, and not having to worry about, you know, oh, well, we need to upgrade our CMS to this new version, it breaks the data API, or we have to manage a migration of thousands, possibly millions of objects. That's not what archivists would be looking for. So for that kind of thing, a CMS can't really compete with something purpose-built. And frankly, speaking for Drupal at least, it still isn't that great at handling large libraries of data. The media module's coming along a fair amount, but it still isn't really there for that kind of purpose. So uh, popular DAM systems, um, it's a space that's still maturing, so there are an enormous amount if you search for them. Um, I've listed a few um, free open source ones, a few proprietary ones, and the number of systems that's there isn't just a reflection of how immature that space is at the moment, it's also a reflection of um, how many different use cases are covered by the umbrella term DAMS. You know, it might be a video library for a film company, or it might be someone who's trying to scan all of their um, documents in order to present them online and um, let people flip through them. And, Different systems will do those different things very, very differently and um, you know, with very different levels of capability. So it's important to make a choice of DAMs that meets the needs of the organization, um, but that also avoids being locked into a particular system, especially for people who are taking a very long-term view. They want to make sure that they've got access to that data for decades to come and not necessarily um, saying free and open source versus proprietary is a, a stark divide along those lines, but definitely for people taking that long-term view, the free open source systems are that bit more compelling. Um, so Fedora Commons, which was one of the ones that was listed on the previous page, um, it's a digital repository and it can be used as a DAMS and it has um, best of breed um, data representations and is used by a lot of institutions around the world for capturing the kind of data that we've been talking about. Um, very well thought out structures for that long-term storage, and it's based on um, Java Tomcat, so it's a very well understood software stack that it's sitting on top of. Um, features of Fedora, um, so all content is managed as data objects and they're ultimately stored on the um, file system in an XML packet. Um, the Fedora system itself does use a database for easy querying, indexing, and that kind of thing. That database can be built from scratch from the XML files at any point if you experience data loss or corruption, or if, say, they introduce a new version of Fedora that has an entirely different database structure because the XML structures will be remaining the same, that database can just be recreated. Um, it allows you to model very complex relationships between those data objects where these different data objects have relationships um, and the kind of relationships that um, some like the Baseball Hall of Fame might have between objects um, can get quite complicated at times. Um, each object contains a number of different data streams. So a data stream might be, for example, an image you might have um, a large high-res scan of the image itself, then you might have different data streams for different views of that image, or for example, in the case of an art gallery, they might even have a scan of 
the back of a canvas if there are some notable features that are worth capturing. So all of those things can be bundled together into a single data packet. And that data packet will also contain uh, metadata about the object. And these data streams don't even all need to be stored on the file system with Fedora. They could be stored somewhere else on the web, and as long as Fedora knows that about those and it has some kind of reference to those, it's able to pull them and deliver them through itself. Um, it also provides for virtual data streams of particular objects, so you could have derivatives that are generated on the fly. Like I said, if you had a very large high-res image, you could deliver a scaled-down version of that image through Fedora, um, and that would just happen transparently. Um, so, I mean, that sounds pretty good. Why wouldn't you just want to use Fedora for your dams? Well, first of all, it's a very technical system to administrate. It's a very dry system to administrate and quite difficult to get to grips with. And for any particular use case for modeling any particular kinds of data that you want to be storing in that dams, it's, um, it's uh, quite difficult to get set up right. And it's not really intended to be used in that way. It's intended to be used as the digital object store. And it's maybe better understood in the same way as you would Drupal for a CMS, where you use it as the scaffold that you then build out the functionality that you want on top of. Which brings us to Island Dora, which you would regard more as a DAMS, although it's not a standalone software package. It's actually using Fedora Commons on the back end um, for doing all of the handling of the data, the long-term archival storage and so forth. But then it has a suite of Drupal modules that integrate with Fedora that give you a management interface to it to um, actually input your data, update your data and that kind of thing. It provides a number of common data types out of the box, so you can just spin up an Island Dora instance and immediately start managing images, large images, videos, that kind of thing, without having to worry about any customization. Um, it will give you import and export capabilities, and there are a number of modules that aren't part of the core Island Dora suite, but are very important for getting that kind of data in and out if you need to integrate with other systems. Um, and yeah, various other features as provided by um, those modules. And it, it's important to note that Islandora isn't the only system that layers on top of Fedora. There are plenty of other systems like bespoke things that have been developed for people, but also other open source solutions. Uh, there's another one, for example, called Project Hydra, which is a Rails based system, uh, but it's a bit less turnkey than Islandora. Um, it's more of a framework driven approach. So, some of the features of Islandora on top of what Fedora has to offer. So, yeah, like I say, it gives you a bunch of solution packs meeting common needs. So, books, images, PDFs, and that kind of thing. And those solution packs also tend to provide viewers for those media types. So, for example, for a large image, which would be a very high resolution scan, probably in something like um, a TIFF, then it will provide a, a zoomable viewer out of the box so that you can um, look at those images and go right into the detail in a handy viewer. Same for videos, it will have a player so that you can um, just preview those videos. Um, it provides extensive metadata support that's laid on top of um, Fedora, so that would be things like Dublin Core, but also another very popular one called Mods. Um, and a lot of archival specific features um, things like Bagit that let you export data in a well-understood packet format that lots of other systems are then able to import. Um, uh, lots of bibliographic metadata, um, preservation metadata, that kind of thing. A lot of things that are very, very um, archive specific. Um, it also provides a REST API so that you can interact with the system and query it over REST if you wanted to build a front end on top of that. Um, fast search and browse with Solar, um, and also uh, more recently the ability to sync content to Drupal nodes itself. So it's important to note that Drupal, although Islandora integrates Fedora Commons with Drupal, it doesn't integrate the content with Drupal. It um, still sits out siloed inside Fedora Commons, um, but you can sync content to Drupal nodes with an add-on module so that any time the content gets updated in your Fedora repository, that gets reflected in your Drupal nodes and they can live as native web content. You can choose various different ways to present them. So to sum up, why would you want to use Islandora if um, you're uh, looking for a dam as well? First of all, 
if you're already familiar with Drupal, if your client's already using Drupal, then it means that they have a single system for managing their um, archival content and their web content. And that's especially ideal when you have the same users who are updating both, which is the, the case in a lot of different institutions. And especially in a lot of institutions that are only really starting to think about a dams for the first time now, um, where previously they may have just been storing all of that in their uh, web CMS. Um, We've got the archival content stored in a best of breed system that's taking the long term archival view. So that even if the website does move from Drupal into the future, um, you know, you've got other front ends that are available for Fedora. You can even layer your own front end onto it if you really want to get down with the nitty gritty of it. Um, and you have multiple ways that you can then integrate your DAMS content with the web. Um, so um, just to give a little taste. This is what your list of content looks like in Fedora Commons by default. Whereas if you're using something like Island Dora, you get a really nice preview listing. You can search, you can click through and see more data, edit that data straight through a fairly native looking Drupal interface. Uh, so I mentioned that there are a number of different ways that you can integrate your Island Dora DAMS content with web. The first one is, you could just open the DAMs directly to the web, that would just be a matter of changing some Drupal permissions, and there are some institutions that want to do something like that, um, that want to open up their entire archive collection for people to browse, for people to search, um, for researchers primarily, but also for the general public, just to be able to really explore what they've got. Um, that wasn't the case for the Baseball Hall of Fame, they, um, at least not yet, I think, they're still in the very early stages of digitising their collection, and. Um, maybe at some point when they feel they've got a more complete representation of what they have, they may do. Um, another option is the Island Dora Sync module that I mentioned before that will sync that content to your Drupal nodes. When we were doing this project, that module wasn't mature yet, so unfortunately that option wasn't available to us, but it would certainly be a very fine option for doing something like that. I'd say only in the case where you're only looking to bring a fraction of what's being captured in Island Dora onto the web, because otherwise you're duplicating a huge amount of data and with media data that can get very large very, very quickly. Um, or finally, the approach that we chose, which is a bit more simple and a bit more decoupled, is just to reference those Island Dora objects in Drupal um, and then have Drupal essentially pull the relevant assets directly from Island Dora. And um, for um, helping us with that, we use the image cache external module which does exactly the same thing as image cache, but is able to pull from sources other than just um, inside the Drupal database itself. It can pull from URLs. So if it has the reference <coughs> to a Lionel and Dora object, then it can um, fashion a request through our um, image cache external to get an image scaled down to exactly the size that you need for it to be displayed on the web. Uh, so lastly, on, um, on this topic, just a few links on getting started by Andorra. There's a sandbox online, so you can just get stuck straight in and have a play with it, see what it has to offer. Um, there's a virtual machine image. If you want to have a bit more of a tinker under the hood, you can just import that into um, VirtualBox and get cracking with it. Um, if you wanted to actually start running a full-level deployment, somebody's provided a chef cookbook that will do all of the um, provisioning for you. And I'd certainly recommend looking into something like that because setting it up, setting up Fedora in particular, can be a little bit fiddly. But lastly, you can do a manual install um, if you wanted to, and there are very thorough instructions for getting set up with it. Okay, so I'll hand over to my colleague Tassos now, who's going to take you through the rich web stories side of the talk. So, the rich web stories. We had three three components that we needed for that project, and one of them was to a way to deliver content. Another was another one was to integrate content from different sources. One was the dams, but then again we wanted to have other parts of the CMS to, to, to share content from other parts of the CMS. And lastly, a way to present content in a way that was manageable uh, between the back end and the front end. So we chose to deliver content to, with paragraphs. I, I don't know how many of you know this module, 
Um, it's, it's fairly new. Um, and what it does is basically, instead of having a wheezy wig editor and a bunch of things, you can have a more modular approach to build blocks of content. Uh, you can create paragraph types, and then for each paragraph type, you can define fields in it. So you can have really different sort of paragraph types. And the, those paragraph types can be anything from text or single lines of text that we can use for something else, or really complex forms that uh, can, can be part of your CMS. Uh, so, let's see how they are used first, and then we'll discuss what we did with them. So, the first step is to add a paragraph field to a, bar uh, to a content type that you want to, to contain paragraphs. And that's this thing here, I don't know if on the back you can see it, but it's just, it, it is just a field that you can add. Paragraphs are entities, so you can have bundles. And bundles basically are the types, the paragraph types that you're going to present to the user. That's what we created for the Baseball Hall of Fame. You can see we have a half widget, which I'll be using as an example. But we have lots of different paragraph types that we can give the ability for, uh, to our users. You can see we have simple things, just a paragraph of text. And we can have a paragraph which is an image gallery which is a slide show essentially. But we can have a small, a single image as well, which is a full scale image in the middle of the page. So that's the form that's presented to the user. You, you have your paragraphs section, basically, and then you have a paragraph type. And you choose one and you add. On this screen, so they have a, a small example of two paragraphs, of two paragraph types. One is called subtitled text. And the other one is uh, the half widget. Um, and that's what it looks like when you add it. <coughs> so, why are we using it? Um, we're using it because it is uh, extendable. And um, you can have complex types with it, and you can mix and match things. We can drag drag and drop places, uh, things into place if you don't like the order. And you can use it to create structural part of the page. So if you remember, I had a part of time that it was called subtitle. And then I, I was able to, to have a subtitle for the text that I included in. And that's, that's this part here. And so you basically give the ability uh, to the editors to create structural parts of the page quite easily. Um, as you saw, we, a, a Hall of Famer is another piece of content in, in our website, <coughs> in, in the CMS, and what we did was uh, we were being able to pull that really easily into that paragraph type. And lastly, we have final control over the HTML output. That's done through templates. And that was one of the reasons that Alex was saying that we ended up with lots of templates, you know, uh, in, in this approach. But it is really, really nice because you give the front end a tool to work uh, with things that they already know, which is markup and rest. So um, that's not markup, really. It's a conceptual uh, thing. Uh, so within a node, we have we're laying out different paragraph items. So, because paragraph item is a bundle, it is essentially it has um, a template. So we can use that template to lay out exactly how this paragraph type we want it to be laid out. So, often when we talk about this stuff, we get this question, uh, well, couldn't you do it with field collections? And um, the thing is that before paragraphs, yes, that's the way that you, you were doing it. Uh, field collection have um, one disadvantage, basically. It is a collection of fields. You can't mix and match different things, or you can't mix and match different things uh, however you wish. Whereas with paragraphs, 
you have a drop down box, you have certain paragraph types that essentially they are a collection of different fields, and then you choose the ones that you want to add. Um, they are exportable with features, which is really nice uh, on the way we work at Product as well. And you can have different types. Uh, different fields in each style, and you can have field collections in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that was the way of delivering the content. Um, a really important thing for us was to integrate content from different uh, types, uh, different places of the CMS. Our initial use case obviously was the vast majority of assets they have they had in the dams. Uh, but then again they had all sorts of stuff like the Hall of Famous which is a directory of all the people that they are uh, in the Hall of Fame. Uh, they had promotions they wanted to do. They had other images that they just added to the CMS which are not part of the dams and so on. So basically we wanted a, a unified way to, to give them a tool to reach content regardless of the source. We wanted to give them a way to, to create things that they supported onwards to journeys, which was really important for them. People not being at dead ends, but being able to explore more and more and more, because they, they really do have a vast, vast amount of data. And then uh, we wanted to support user engagement. And to do that, we needed to, to have a tool, a way to actually uh, being able to share everything on the page, the page that it's set for individual assets and we didn't want to care whether that was a dams asset or an image uh, added locally or a story that they ran on or a famous profile or whatever. So to do that we needed to have a way to, to pre-process per node type and that's actually really easy to do. On your pre-process node you just have a function that So you have a function that actually calls another function. And uh, that way, you can get the individual node types to be called. So what that did for us was to basically have finer control of the content. And it gave us the ability to, to use DAMS assets in various parts and places of, of of, uh, of, of, of the building play, page as hero images or as sidebar images or as full page images or images that are in, in, in the uh, slide so and, and then we had the ability to actually add um, Twitter cards in every aspect of the site and depending on what you were seeing you, you got a different Twitter card uh, which is a nice integration in Twitter. I don't know if you know what Twitter cards are. They're just um, so when you share to Twitter through it, and the page is structured with uh, meta tags to be uh, uh, with open graph tags to be a Twitter card, then you have like these nice previews. So you can have like a picture if you're sending a picture, or you can have a small description if you're sharing a story, or you can have uh, different parts and elements, and you can have a preview of a video is a video that you were sharing. So, and then, um, yeah, we, we were able to, to interchangeably integrate, uh, especially on the dams and images stuff, and present, give to the front end one unified way to work, rather than they, rather than they have to actually decide and do stuff on the templates. So just to give you an idea of parts of pages that we're creating this way, this is the hero image. This is a title, this is just a paragraph of text. This uh, contents area over there is dynamically created from all the eight, uh, the subtitle tags that you're uh, entering in paragraph types. So basically, when an editor is presented with, a, with an empty canvas and he just fills in content and the rest of it is uh, managed by the uh, info, really. That's, that's another type. Um, so this is a subtitle, and this is a text, a paragraph of text with image uh, on the sidebar, and that image can be 
uh, is placed there automatically and then you can have it as, as other things. If you press, press it, you can share it and you can have it in that uh, letter box. That's, that's another um, example, that's the Hall of Famous page. The, that guy lived from 1887 to 9, 9, 1907. And that's an original photo that's really, it's coming straight from the dams and it's fed to the hero humans uh, area. And there's uh, also uh, info on him. Um, is that the link now? Uh, uh, not as far as I know. So, um, I'll try to... Uh, <laughs> To help break yeah, it. yes, please. <laughs> so this is uh, something that we don't advise to do, right? but I, I'll just have it here just to show what we can do with uh, that. That's an actual page of the site, and it's the page that they they are announcing their class of 15. So they have this. Oh, okay. Wi-Fi. Oh no, you can you just uh, uh, if you just right click on it and say uh, open in it down. So oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, so that's the page you see here. Uh, I know it's uh, immediately um, visible to uh, everyone, uh, but you can see the different elements we have within it. Um, can you uh, just yeah expand it and just scroll down? So you you can have uh, subtitles and quotes and pull stuff in of uh, however they come. And if you scroll down to the bottom of it. Um, just there, they, they have like, um, they have their shops and promos and stuff, and all these are rearrangeable. Um, I believe that's something really difficult to do in this specific page to rearrange content, but uh, in, in a more normal circumstance, you basically have pieces of data. You just <coughs> rearrange the way that you can actually, um, thank you Alex, yeah. um, you can actually yeah, try different stuff, try different things, approaches, and have it really work. So, um, basically, if, if we want a hierarchical approach on that, we have two paragraph types. Different. Uh, so we have paragraph types that they use entity uh, references to reference content and pull it in. And then we have uh, paragraph types that they are themselves the content, like the subtitle of a, a text. Um, so, so far, uh, we show uh, a way that's an extensible way to actually um, deliver content and pull content from different sources. So, the question is, wouldn't it be nice to have the same way of control on, on the things that they are presented within the paragraph types, the paragraph items? when we are referencing coding from other places. And so basically, yeah, what we have now is we have the paragraph items, and we have templates for each of these, but when we get into those, we, we, when we get into a paragraph item that they have entity references, then we would like to have control over these as well. So we can have complete control of the markup that's lagging on the page. And that's exactly what view modes are. And uh, it's one of those little hidden uh, Drupal 7 features. And it's really uh, wrapped up in uh, Drupal 8. Now you can have view modes in everything, and you can access it through the interface. But for Drupal 7, you need to have this call. And you, you need to create and attach, basically, views, uh, view modes to, to content. Um, View modes, for those of you who don't know, is every node comes with two default view modes, and that's, uh, oh sorry, I have five minutes left, so I'm going to skip uh, So you have the default and the teaser, but essentially, without code, you can actually create as many as you'd like. And what you have is a way to actually um, sort of sort and create the fields and manage the fields that you want available in a template. Um, so for that view mode, which is the display name that have a position in industrial year, you can basically create this. And you can 
Um, you can control that through a template as well. So how to use it on the paragraph type is when you are in a, you have an entity reference, you just can make the rendered entity display as a view mode. And that's really that's really what it is. And you, you select the view mode and then you have it available as as a as a as a template. So you append it on the paragraph uh, as the view mode name and you have a TPL for that. So its view mode has its own display fields. Its view mode has its own template file. You can apply logic per view mode when you're accessing uh, when you're uh, preprocessing the node, and then you can basically give the front end a way to work that's how it works. Um, so just wrap it all up. Paragraphs give us a way to deliver content. Entity references give us a way to, to pull sparse content into the same thing. And entity view modes we it provide us a way to, to have final control of that, that content that we're bringing in. Um, any questions, please? <coughs> can, within one of these paragraph entities, uh, can you pull in a view? Mm. <coughs> because that looks to me, I mean, those related Hall of Famers, for example, that looks to me like a view with, a, what you would call it, a variable um, in the URL that says, if I'm on node 53, pull in these related items for it. Well, actually, uh, a, a view, a, a paragraph type is uh, is is uh, is just as a no, uh, is just as a content type. You can add field to it. Uh, I'm not, does anybody know if there's a field that you can actually pull well, any views? If, if there's well, a, can, if, if there's a field, yeah, if there's a field text. type, yeah, yeah, then you can do it. We have. I mean, that's not the approach we we got here because we wanted final control, so they sure. have it. But if there's a field for it, you can do it. It is. Okay. It yeah. is entities. Well, what, what we did, we use um, display suite, which works quite mm -hmm. well for, mm -hmm. for managing those display view modes, etc. And um, within display suite, you can create a code field, and you can turn the view block into a field. Yeah. So you can mm -hmm. sort of get around it that way. Yeah. It's a bit more convoluted, but it works really well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that mm -hmm. sounds really. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. What's the user interface though? Integrating with either drawer. For the editors, they, can they browse on the door or do they have to copy and paste the URL? They, um, well, the editors, know, if they know the ID of the island or object they want, they just uh, add uh, an, a dumps asset node with that ID in it, and then the rest is handled by our preprocessors. And uh, it's, it, it is as if it is visible to Drupal. So, so just yeah. an ID. At the, at the moment, it's just being done with paste, but one of the enhancements that's going to be added at some point is for that um, field to be an autocomplete field that can query um, Islandora's API and just pull through a list as you start to type for the title of the okay. object that you want. Yes, please. In the case of the baseball hall, hall of Fame site, did you use the default body? Uh, the default body field at all, or was it just all uh, like the I'm not sure. In, in, in the story template, yeah. in the story content type, which is basically the one that's using the paragraphs, no, we're not using it. Okay. We just, um, we, have diff uh, we have other fields that, such as uh, summary fields and things to okay. actually create the open graph uh, meta tags, but right. other than that, no. Okay. Yes, please. Am I right in thinking that from the point of view of a content editor, um, all the content types they have available to them, if they open one, each one will have a fixed number of paragraphs, they wouldn't be able to change the number of paragraphs? Uh, yes, you're correct. That's something that they um, would have to be built by us so they can have available. Yeah. But the way we, um, the way that this works, right, up until now is really what was they, they by building them a, a story content type that it is so um, so extensible uh, they they don't have the need for different content types what they had before was another a content type for a press release a content type for a story a content type for a news item and so 
we scrabbled that and we gave them away to create whatever they wanted. It's just one single content type. That's a story content type for us. And that can be a press release, which is just a single paragraph of text, and maybe an image on the side. It is. <laughs> That's more interesting. <laughs> so you like a, a huge page with so much content in it, and um, they can do whatever they want with that. So we don't have the uh, basically if they need another building block, that's something that they would actually have to ask us to to give them. But um, yeah, they could add any number of paragraphs of the pre-specified types to a page, so it could be just a single one, or it could be like the page that Tassel's demonstrated that was extremely long. They probably had 10s, 20s, 30s, um, different paragraphs added to that page. Right, okay, now I'm confused. So, so I, th I think Tassel's may have but instead she was asking about the paragraph types rather than the, the actual I physical blocks. I'm a content editor, I make myself a new page from a content type, so I yeah. node. One day I might want to put three paragraphs in, the next day I might want another one. <laughs> the same content type I might want to put seven paragraphs in. Can I do that? Yes, yes you absolutely right. can do that. Um, you can add a restriction. It's effectively like a repeating field in any so other field. So thing you can compare it to field collection where you can vary the number. So yeah, so you, right. you, could, you could limit it to five or you could say unlimited and they could add, as, as we saw in that fairly extreme yeah. example, goodness knows how many. Right. Thanks. Cool. Have you done any layouts that are not just kind of stacked down like that, where they're a little bit more complex? Uh, we've done layouts within the paragraph types. Yeah. Uh, so we have images on the side and text. I mean. Yeah. Uh, but on the paragraph themselves, no. But it, I, I believe it's going to be fairly easy since we, we yeah. really have like the, the we have really nice separation of content and. Um, so you could have you know two paragraph types that are like fifty percent width. Yeah. And then yeah. you put those next you, to each other I mean, so they stack nicely. And you, you, you already, we already have like a template for that, so right. we actually have that. Is there any uh, I'm trying to think, overall structure in the final page code? I'm thinking of if you wanted to export it as XML or something like that, mm -hmm. you have, say, the page title, some text, and then you've got a subhead and some paragraphs under that, another subhead and some paragraphs. Does the system have any idea that, in fact, these paragraphs are related to that subhead and are all part of a subsidiary part of the structure? Or is this really just, this is how it's laid out and that's it is laid the out structure for it? Paragraph type after paragraph type. Okay. So, uh, But you could, I think, you are able to nest paragraphs, aren't you? You are able to nest so paragraphs. if you wanted to have something that was a more Define structure like that as well, then you could do it by. Because yeah. that's, that's great for a page that you're looking at, but yeah. it's going to be really hopeless if you're trying to actually send the data to something else. I can yeah. see. Yeah, sure. Okay. It's just a matter of um, uh, striking the balance between okay, what's yeah, yeah. the yeah. most semantic thing and what's the best content editing experience. Yeah, no, for that I'm sure it's right, but in other situations, you might want to have it. So I, I think we have to wrap it up. It's a as well, though, isn't it? Paragraphs would be exposed to what you're taking. Um, they certainly could be. I'm, I'm not sure um, whether they are at the moment. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, can we discuss that? Yeah. After all, it's, uh, we're really taking the time. Thank you yeah. very much. So, uh, <laughs> there's uh, another thing, yeah, we could say we're hiring. So, um, if you are, or if you know, a uh, senior front-end developer or a graduate developer, you can uh, visit that link or pass that link to um, some interesting parties. Thank you very much. Thanks.